Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Fin Week Money Matters. This is the show that helps you manage your finances. I'm Dumisho Greater. Coming up on the show today, we take a look at Dimension Data's involvement in cycling events. We take a look at the outlook for MTN and the growth challenges that are faced by South African banks. And we have a panel of experts in studio uh, who are going to talk to us about how your credit works or your credit record works and what you can do to fix it. But before we get into all of that, do remember that we welcome your comments. So email us uh, to at uh, ABN or money matters at ABN at 360.com. But first, uh, let's take a look at the trend of the week. Not that long ago, cycling was a Cinderella sport in South Africa and sponsorship and media coverage were hard to come by. However, with events like the Cape Epic, which is kicking off on Sunday, the sport has grown massively here in recent years. And this July, our own Dimension Data will be the technology partner for the Tour de France. That is one of the world's most prestigious sporting events. But in studio with us to talk cycling and technology is Sean Joubert. He's the managing director of Dimension Data. Sean, thanks so much. Like I said, cycling is no longer a poor man's sport. Uh, we're going to be seeing uh, chief executives, we're going to be seeing a managing director such as yourself taking on this 800 kilometer route. For people like myself who've never even been on a bicycle, what does this entail? First of all, thank you for the opportunity and having me. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity. First of all, Dimension Data will be providing an IT solution and seamless service for the Cape Epic. What I mean by that, we'll be building out an IT infrastructure in the race villages that will really allow connectivity. So we really are bringing connectivity to the race villages al along the, along the, the route. Um, this will allow, I think it's approximately 4,000 devices that will be able to access the network across different route locations over the eight day period. And more importantly, I think it provides a communications platform, a communications platform for the strong media contingent at the Cape Epic and that will allow them to upload um, images, stories, video footage and beam it to all over the world and really take the Cape Epic to all those thousands of enthusiastic cyclists across the world. So we're very, very excited about the opportunity. So not just the Cape Epic, but you've also signed on as a technology partner for the Tour de France. How different is cycling here in South Africa versus Europe and the business opportunity that you saw there? Um, I think it's fair to say absolutely there's a very strong cycling culture across Europe but I see that dramatically changing um, in South Africa and the Africa continent. My, myself I'm a very passionate cyclist, I'm somewhat biased. Um, I have been cycling for, for 10 years but if I, can, if I look whether it's road cycling, mountain biking, any discipline across cycling, um, 10 years ago you probably would have found a handful of cyclists out there on the roads and mountain bike routes. You know, two, three years ago, you now would have found hundreds. Mm -hmm. And if you actually t go now on some of the routes, be it the mountain biking routes or some of the road routes across Johannesburg, me living in Johannesburg, um, there's thousands of cyclists out on Saturday and Sunday. You know, I think if you look at South Africa, we have two of the largest mass participation timed events in the world, being the Argus and 94.7. We have the Cape Epic, yes. which is the largest TV-covered multi-stage mountain biking route that attracts the best of the best um, across the world, mountain bikers. Um, there's just so many events um, that, that we now have in South Africa and I think that's fueling the growth that you've seen in cycling today. Yeah. Uh, Sean, thank you so much. Best of luck with that. We will be watching uh, your participation in the Tour de France as the technology partner there. Uh, thank you so much to Sean Joubert. He's the Managing Director at Dimension Data. Let's now look at this week's cover story. We've seen all the major banks release their financial results in the past few weeks and they continue to keep a firm hand on the tiller as they try to improve the quality of their loan books and contain impairments. Uh, with South Africa's economy expected to grow by less than 2% this year and competition that is increasing, growth will continue to be a challenge. But in studio with us to talk about this week's cover story is FinWeek's uh, journalist, Yana Murray. Uh, Yana, thanks so much for your time economic headwinds that the banking sector is currently facing? Yes, I think low growth is one of them. I think also the low interest rate environment is going to continue for longer than they thought. And low interest rates 
typically mean lower margins for banks. And don't ask me to explain the technical details <laughs> behind that. Um, but I think also, you know, they they they're really struggling still to get over that hangover of the of the two thousands. You know, when when the world came crashing down in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, they're still struggling to get all those bad loans and. Yeah, you know, so that's why they're much more disciplined about who they're lending money to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, we saw things, banks like APSA, for example, their home loans, they've lost massive market share in the home loan space because that's an area where their fingers got burnt yes. um, before the crash. So I think the challenge is to find these new areas of revenue. You can only increase bank charges by so much because you're in a competitive environment. So where do you, where do you find the new market opportunities? Yes. And, and obviously we've seen people go outside of South Africa to, to try and get growth. Mm. So outside of South Africa, they are faced with uh, increased competition. Uh, another thing that comes to mind when you look at the banking sector is what is the outlook? Uh, if you look at the banking stocks on the JSC, they said retailers are overvalued. So the outlook for this particular sector? I think it's an interesting, it's been interesting to watch the results come in this year. Um, I think, you know, the African growth story is phenomenal. They're getting massive growth rates um, elsewhere on the continent. But there's also a lot of risks involved. You know, you see countries like Nigeria and Angola, um, you know, where the oil price is really hammering those economies, commodity prices coming down. So banks are cautious. And, and even though it's fast growth or high growth markets, the overall contribution to, to their results are still minute, really. Um, I think some banks have been doing really well. Standard Bank have managed to turn around their African mm -hmm. operations. They're finally making money there. Um, so it will be an interesting space to watch, but it's certainly not uh, the only solution. You know, they will have to find other, other areas to improve efficiencies. Um, I think they'll be pushing their digital platforms a lot more. Um, it will be an interesting space to see. I think, um, you know, if you look at companies like First Rand, where yes. the share price have run quite, quite massively over the last few years, you know, shareholders probably should be a bit cautious, but then it's strong cash flow generators, so you know the dividends will always come through. So it really depends on what you want as a, as a shareholder. Mm -hmm. Well, Jana, speaking about First Rand, they released uh, their interim results this week, and CNBC Africa's Gugule Tukele sat down with the company a chief executive, that is Cesar Ngasana, and started by asking him about whether he is happy with his legacy at the group after he announced his retirement last week. I think I'm reasonably satisfied. You know, there's always a lot more to do and so on, but it is also important for the organization to have new energy to, you know, drive succession planning and so on. Uh, you know, for my part, you know, having been here for nine years, I think is enough. You know, I've always maintained that uh, I don't think it's a good idea for a CEO to be in a position uh, for more than 10 years, especially in the kind of environment to where I find myself. So. Uh, it is time for me to go and do other things as well, but also allow new energy, new ideas uh, to drive the organization forward. We've seen the uh, uh, plan with regard to uh, leadership changes being executed very smoothly. So I take it shareholders need not be concerned about the strategic direction of the company uh, now that you're leaving. I hope not, uh, because, you know, especially maybe talking as a shareholder now myself. Yes. Uh, it is important that we, we recognize that we have exactly the right team that is going to take the company forward. Mm. On the rumors that the R&B chief executive uh, might be stepping down anytime soon, have you uh, a response to that? Well, we did, as part of the announcement that we made on Friday, indicate that uh, Alan Pullinger, who is the current CEO of r &B, is going to be moving into a, a, a deputy CEO position at first rand. We've started a process at r &B to fill the vacancy there. Let's touch on your numbers. Overall, we saw normalized earnings up by 15%, dividend up 21%, and return on equity up by 24%. This is substantially a lot higher than some of your peers in the industry. What's driven the growth in the numbers, and is it uh, sustainable? Well, if you just look at the history, you know, what we've been able to deliver over the last couple of years, we certainly believe it is sustainable. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. You know, if you look at our operating franchises, F&B continues to do quite well. They posted... Uh, normalized earnings or profit before tax, you know, of about 16 or 17 percent, regardless of where you're looking at. Uh, you know, West Bank has continued to do very well considering the tough economic cycle, which affects the vehicle financing business particularly, uh, growing their profits at 8 percent. And RMB, you know, growing their profits at 7 percent, especially in the context of the additional credit provision overlays that we created in recognition of some of the exposures that we have, especially in oil and gas, in countries such as Nigeria. 
you know, that performance is a very credible, very uh, solid performance. Mm -hmm. So our operating franchises are doing quite well. The number of things that we continue to do, we continue to focus on serving our customers, uh, migrating customers to electronic channels, so that continues to be the case. Managing costs is always an issue, it has been an issue over the last six years or so. And, and therefore, the bottom line sort of uh, is, is a sustainable level. We're taking a very short break now, but when we come back, we'll be talking credit stores. Welcome back. You're still with us right here on Fin Week Money Matters. It can be easy to give in to the temptation of opening a new clothing account or get the credit card or personal loan to pay for that holiday. However, it is important to keep in mind that all these things, they affect your credit score. In studio to explain to us how credit scores are determined and what you should do to improve it is Mahauta Mpatlele, uh, accredited court annexured mediator at the National Debt Mediation Association. Jeff Miller, CEO of TransUnion, and I'm joined uh, also by the Finweek journalist Mbutlen Dweni, who wrote the story. Mahauta, let me start with you. What are the things that people are doing wrong that count against them when we look at a credit score? Well, first thing, people don't understand how credit bureaus work and what information is kept on the bureaus. They also don't understand how their payment behavior affects their credit bureau reports. You know, a lot of consumers think that if you skip a month and pay double next month, you know, you will be fine. Or if you pay half or if you don't, you know, you are a few days late, it's okay. It's actually not okay because that will, will, will give the credit provider an indication of whether you're a good payer or a bad payer. Mm -hmm. So it's quite important that people understand that they need to pay on time and they need to pay the full amount. And if they cannot do that, it's better to engage with the credit providers. A lot of the time when people are experiencing payment difficulties, they keep quiet, you know, they don't take telephone calls and they don't understand that as long as they don't communicate with the credit provider, there are steps that credit providers then take that would then reflect on their bureau report. For example, if your, your account is handed over to legal or if then the credit provider writes off the debt or mm. notes you as a defaulter, mm. all that information will then reflect. Whereas if you engage with them, mm. you might delay some of those processes or they might not happen at all mm. because you then can come to an arrangement with the credit provider. Jeff, if I'm sitting in a situation now where I have been handed over and uh, my name is tarnished, yep. how do I get it back and how long does that process take? Uh, so you know, there's very technical rules around how long data is kept, but, but um, pretty much generally around 24 months. Um, that being said, it, it depends on how, how delinquent or, or um, how late you were. So as, as she mentioned, if you were 30 days late and you've caught up, um, credit grantors aren't going to look necessarily too unfavorably about that. Mm -hmm. But if they see a consistent pattern of mm -hmm. misbehavior, then they're going to be very wary about loaning money to that. So I think best thing to do is pay on time. If you don't pay on time, make sure you get caught up on your payments and continue to, to keep up with those. So, you know, uh, it, it depends. It really depends. But, you know, two years if, you're re if you really go bad. Mm, two years. Pute, you wrote the story. Uh, what were some of the key things that came out? And we do have our panel of experts here. Insights on what you discovered when you were writing the story. I think that the, there seems to be some confusion about the National Credit Amnesty <laughs> Act. Mm. You know, people thought, well, everything is going to be written off, you know, um, once they have either made a payment or, or something. So I don't know from the pan the, yes. the, the um, experts um, side mm -hmm. or point of view um, for people out there at home I mean what happens if maybe you have paid it off and I, I, I want now to add more credit or ask for more credit what 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 in which state are you at um, so once again it depends on, on how bad the situation was I think one of one of the good things that came out of, of the credit amnesty and then the credit act um, was that if you do have a judgment against you and you pay up that judgment, 
Um, you don't have to go to court anymore to get a rescission. You can go directly to the lender. The lender will issue that and will remove that data from the bureau. Mm -hmm. um, so that, if, if it's really bad, uh, you know, that would be the first step that I would take is pay off the judgment, mm -hmm. um, go to your credit provider, they'll issue a letter and we'll remove that information. Um, but that being said, um, you know, if, you're, if you're paying poorly, um, just because the judgment is now off, there's still going to be a, a reflection of that negative yeah. behavior yeah. that remains on the credit bureau. Um, and, and to be frank, there has to be, because if they had wiped off everything, lenders would be afraid to lend because they wouldn't know. Um, so I, I think you know, the, they tried to you know, I guess do the best they could to give some relief to consumers, mm -hmm. um, but still make sure that the, the lending system was maintained. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and just mm -hmm. another question. Um, when one is maybe looking for um, vehicle um, loans or a home mm -hmm. loan, you know, you're, you're often encouraged to shop around. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you shop around, um, it kind of weighs against you. Why, why is that and how does <laughs> that work? So, so crediting, we call them credit inquiries, yep. so that, that basically tracks every time you go and apply for credit. Okay. Uh, because it, it's actually very predictive, but um, we do distinguish between um, what we would call rate shopping okay. uh, and what would just be normal credit behavior. So um, actually models and credit grantors will look and see if you had three auto loan inquiries mm -hmm. or you know, vehicle asset finance in a 30 day period, they would count that as one. Mm -hmm. Or same with the home loans. However, if you went and shopped for six microfinance loans mm -hmm. in consecutive days, that would be deemed risky behavior because you're out trying to get money any which way you can. Okay. Um, so we do try to cater for that. It's, it's not 100% perfect, but in general, you know, we would encourage rate shopping. It's absolutely the responsible thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's really not going to harm you uh, dramatically. Mm -hmm. okay. Mahauta, mm -hmm. I'm looking at your, your title and you are an accredited court <laughs> and ex-mediator <laughs> at the National <laughs> Debt Mediation Association. Firstly, yeah. what is it that you do? And when it comes to a debt counseling or debt management, if somebody's already in debt counseling, they're now out, uh, how long after are they now able to start asking for, for financing again? As the NDMA, I think we think the first step is to look at somebody's behavior and we try and change people's behavior. So when a person approaches us, we would look at their credit bureau record and say, how are you managing your repayments? And then we would look at their expenses to say, how are you managing your expenses? And sometimes just by doing that, a person can, can go back to normalizing their repayments. So, so we don't rush to put people under debt counseling. And then those that are, have like large areas and something has happened in their lives such that they cannot afford the monthly installments, such sometimes the only solution is to restructure those debts.